Jeffrey Gundlach joins me now in a CNBC exclusive. Good to have you back, Jeffrey. Good to see you, Judge. Good to be here. What's the Fed going to do today? Well, I think everybody knows they're going to cut rates by 25 basis points. It's pretty interesting that just a few weeks ago, people were talking about a 50 basis point potential cut and even an intermeeting cut uh, that was sort of in the wind there back at the end of August. But now the bond market has really taken away the possibility of a 50 basis point cut with the backup in rates that's happened globally of about 25 or 30 basis points over the last couple of weeks. So the Fed has a pretty easy job this time. Bond market says one cut, uh, no need for uh, anything drastic. And yet the uh, stage is perfectly set for that uh, interest rate cut today. The real question is, what's going to happen with the dots? I kind of think that the Fed almost wishes they hadn't come up with these dots thing because they've had a hard time predicting what their future path would be pretty much for the past year. So we'll see what happens with the dots. You might remember that the, at the uh, June meeting, the idea was that they wouldn't be cutting rates here in 2019. But then just one meeting later, they had to cut them once. And they had no cut for uh, 19, but one cut for 2020. It would be interesting to see if they uh, bring that cut in 2020 forward to 2019. I think that's going to happen mm -hmm. and maybe say that 2020 they won't have to cut rates. Economic data got really soft globally there for a while, but it has improved a little bit if you watch it closely in the past few weeks. So uh, the, the, the sort of urgency that was out there for more drastic things went away, except for, of course, that kerfuffle with the repo market uh, not having enough uh, reserves and leading to this amazing spike in the uh, overnight rate uh, yesterday to almost 10 percent briefly before the Fed did the repo uh, work. So one thing that might have to happen here is the Fed might have to start uh, QE light, as I call it, uh, meaning that they go back to expanding their balance sheet in line with the increase in currency to get the uh, reserves, the free reserves in the system higher than what seems to be this toggle point of where it is right now at about a uh, little under 1.4 trillion. They'll probably have to get that higher. Be interesting to see if Jay Powell talks about that in the press conference. I think he has to. I think he'll be asked about it. I mean, that's not, more QE is not the only solution you would admit to what's taken place in, in the repo market. It's the one that you've mentioned. It's I think maybe undoubtedly the m most dramatic one, but it's not the only solution. And how worried no. should we be about it? Um, that's a good question, how worried you should be. Clearly, uh, short rates getting out of the Fed's control even briefly is problematic, particularly because of the template of the past when it happened back in 08 surrounding Lehman Brothers. It doesn't seem at all like that's likely to happen here. But the problem is that there's not enough reserves in the system, clearly, to provide the liquidity. And what they used to do before the global financial crisis was, again, I'll call it QE light. What they do is they expand the balance sheet in line with the growth in the currency. They could always do some sort of permanent repo facilities and the like. Right. But it just seems to me that the Fed is almost anxious to start increasing their balance sheet again. You know, back in January, in a in a U-turn from the December disaster where they said QT forever in, in spite of uh, economic realities, you know, uh, they started talking about the potential of QE not being an extraordinary policy anymore, but a regular policy tool. So it would just seem that the, the, the skids are greased for the Fed to go and do that uh, growth of the balance sheet in line with the growth in the currency like they did prior to the global financial crisis. But the fact that uh, short rates are spiking, obviously, is in no way a positive. The fact that the reserves seem to be at the right level, except that they're not, there obviously are pockets in the system where the liquidity isn't there. And that's always a cause con for concern, especially because the markets are in a fairly uh, stable place right now. You would imagine what would happen if you were in a situation where there was a real squeeze at, uh, at a quarter end or a year end or during a, a risk off sort of a, an experience in the markets. So the Fed will, will address this, I think. Um, but I, again, I think it's going to be through expanding the balance sheet because they want to go that way. Look what, look what Draghi just did last week. I mean, he said $20 uh, billion dollars of QE, uh, 20 billion euros, rather, of QE per month on an open-ended basis. I mean, it's starting to see. I, it was interesting. I was in Europe at the time last week, and I was meeting with a lot of very, very major asset allocators. And I noticed a real change in sentiment regarding what's happening with negative interest rates and ECB policy. The change that I observed was uh, there's been a pivot away from this idea 
that the circumstance that we're in in the ECB and the banking system there is temporary. Uh, last time I was in Europe, there was this feeling that negative interest rates were sort of a novelty that you had to kind of live through and suffer through and endure if you were a financial institution. But the mood now seems to be that there's an awareness growing that this is a, a, a fundamental policy that central planners want to get the inflation rate substantially higher than the interest rate, or put another way, to keep the interest rate very much below the inflation rate for negative real interest rates. I think they're starting to realize that this debt problem that we have in the developed world is really starting to show up in the financial system. Just look at uh, the underperformance of bank stocks as a sector in Japan, in Europe, pretty much persistently ever since interest rates went negative. They're starting to realize that this is sort of a, a situation we've got ourselves in that has a long-term problem. Uh, weirdly, there's a contradiction between the long-term problem being exacerbated by short-term solutions. I mean, mm -hmm. The way that central planners are dealing with the long-term problem of negative interest rates being fatal to the banking system is weirdly more negative interest rates because they think that's going to help in the short term. But eventually, as we know, and this is a theme that I've been thinking about a lot as this year has progressed, eventually a lot of short-term solutions that exacerbate long-term problems lead you into a, uh, a, a reality where finally enough short-term things lead to the, sh the, the, the future, the long-term, being now. And I think that's starting to happen with negative interest rates and the, uh, the solution in terms of slowing down the long-term uh, coming into our reality is to keep interest rates well below the inflation rate. In, in other words, negative real interest rates as much as possible which is a really problem for investors who are fixed income focused, like they are particularly in Europe, where they're basically saying that the objective of the central planners is to make bondholders lose, purchase, lose purchasing power systematically over time. Yep. And uh, that's, that's kind of happening here in the U.S. I mean, the Fed funds rate's about to be cut down below 2%, and yet the core CPI just came out at 2.4, uh, the highest number in a decade. So I guess they're sort of succeeding at getting the inflation rate up with the uh, with the policies, and we're going to and now uh, the inflation rate in the United States is higher than the yield on anything in the U.S. Treasury market, at least on the core CPI. Help me understand why you said this week you wouldn't bet on lower interest rates, and you think that rates have put in a bottom this year, while at the same time you're suggesting here that the Fed could do more QE and they could continue well, cutting. How does that all play together? Well, first of all, the Fed cutting short-term interest rates doesn't necessarily mean that long-term interest rates will go down. And also, historically, quantitative easing has actually been uh, correlated with rising long-term interest rates. This has been something that has been a conundrum for a lot of analysts for a decade now, nearly, that every time the Fed ramps up QE, people think it's going to suppress long-term interest rates. But the opposite has happened pretty much every time that when they do QE, it's weird. I think the, the market sees it as stimulative to the economy, and it raises long-term interest rates. So I think one of the, re the reason I say that I think long-term interest rates have seen their low for the year is primarily due to the action that we saw into the bottom of interest rates in August, which was the kind of panic, the kind of one-sided, uh, this is, this is a, a freight train forever type of feeling which was exactly the same as how it felt in July of 2016 when the 10-year Treasury actually did bottom at 132, which was the orthodox low. In August, we got to 144 amid almost an identical setup of really a panic for a buying of, of Treasuries and a deflationary sort of feeling and this idea that the Fed needed to cut rates 50 basis points or even the president saying we should have negative interest rates or at least zero interest rates. This is kind of a crescendo of sentiment that I, I believe uh, has been rejected. Now that the 30-year Treasury is, not, is well above 2%, I mean, it, it got down into the 195 zone or so on the 30-year, but now uh, we're above the pivot point, which was the low of 2012 and 2013, uh, 2016, rather. So I just, I just think that we have one of these exhaustion moves. One thing that I, I think is really an interesting contradiction I haven't heard anybody talk about in financial markets is the volatility indices, which, Judge, we talked about back in May when I was with you in, uh, out there in that beautiful day in New York City, mm -hmm. the day after the Sone conference. I talked about my highest conviction idea was that volatility was going to spike, and it did almost immediately. Uh, the VIX index went way up, but now the VIX index has settled down to about 15, which is kind of a historical average number. A lot of people thought it would never get there again once it was living down below 10 during 2017 for so long. 
but uh, now at 15. But the move index, which is really the idea of volatility on bonds, remains incredibly elevated in spite of the fact that bonds have really kind of stabilized and uh, aren't showing a lot of volatility. The move index is double nearly where it was in, in May, on May 7th, when we got together there in New York, which kind of suggests that so, somehow there's a belief in the bond market that volatility is not going to go away. In, in my view, with, with the market stabilizing the way it has in terms of yields, it seems to me that the move index being higher is a little bit of a danger single, signal that maybe interest rates will move higher in a more aggressive fashion because they've certainly stopped falling. Uh, on, the, on the long end. So there's a weird contradiction between a settling down of volatility ideas in the stock market, which is understandable given the, the fact that it's been relatively stable, mm -hmm. although, again, a, a seesaw ride uh, from the end of July into where we are today. I, I, uh, and yet the bond market is showing uh, real nervousness about volatility, which weirdly did show up not on the long end, which is the move index is what that's talking about, but rather on the short-term interest rates with that incredible spike yesterday. So I think you know, the economic data has gotten a little bit better, yet I still think when we put it all together, when we look at all of our indicators for recession, it seems that there is an increasing uh, probability of recession before the 2020 election. Uh, obviously, the yield curve being flat and even inverted from Fed funds, at least at this moment, uh, out through the curve, you know, that's uh, clearly something that is a, for, a precursor of potential recession. What you hear a lot in financial media is after the curve inverts, and the media likes to focus on the 2's 10 spread. I'm not sure why exactly, but it seems like when the 2 10 spread goes negative, even by a tiny amount in the U.S. Treasury market, you start to hear all these, is this a recession signal? But the way history kind of has proved to work is that when the curve inverts for the first time, and I, talk, and I really look at not 2's 10's, but we can look at that if you want. I look at the Fed funds rate out to the 10 year or the 30 year. What happens historically is the curve inverts well before a recession. And I've heard many guests on CNBC over the past several months point out this fact correctly, that the curve inverts well in advance of the front edge of the recession. But what people don't understand is that when the recession is getting to be close to your doorstep, the curve actually steepens out because the Fed gets the joke, finally, that they're behind the curve and they need to cut interest rates sure. more. But we've and mentioned so the, that, the right? If you, get, if you get in a rate cut cycle... It could steepen. It, it would steepen the curve. Sure, absolutely, and that's what's happened historically. And and when the curve steepens out with the Fed cutting, a lot of people say, "Oh, this is a sigh of relief. It shows that you know the the Fed's on the case and uh, recession could be a, a, a averted." But historically, that hasn't been true. What happens is once the curve starts steepening out, uh, recession's getting closer and closer. The indicator for recession that to me is the most uh, compelling in terms of, of watching and being concerned about is consumer sentiment comparing how consumers in the United States feel about the present contrasted to how they feel about the future. What happens before recessions every time in a very convincing uh, pattern is that first consumers start to feel bad about the future. They say the future looks worse than how I feel about the present. And that started quite a while ago now where the view of the future was much grimmer than the view of today. That puts you on kind of a notice, just like the yield curve inverting, that maybe you're supposed to be on recession watch. But then what happens is the consumer continues to be pessimistic about the future, but then their attitudes about the present start to deteriorate. And that has started to happen, particularly in Europe, but also in the United States to a, a more minor but not uh, insignificant degree. Consumers' view of the present is starting to deteriorate pretty rapidly, and their view of the future continues to be pretty grim. And this is really a very common sign of the consumer maybe being poised to pull back. We, we haven't really seen that yet so much. No, we haven't. That the, data happen. again, the data again today um, suggests otherwise. Yeah, that's right. But consumer spending, or rare consumer attitudes and consumer spending are notorious for being very strong right at the last minute before a recession. It's the, it's the consumer ideas about how things are going that collapse the last. So CEO confidence has started to deteriorate noticeably with new orders really in a free fall. We've seen manufacturing uh, not doing well. Industrial production came out higher than expected yesterday, but it still declined on a year-over-year -year basis because the number that rolled off from a year ago was even higher th than last time. So there, there are some indications. I mean, the ISM manufacturing is below 50. That's not a good sign. So it's much more of a mixed bag. Some of the times when we've talked in the past, we've talked about how there's uh, really, it was no 
compelling case that a recession might come within the next 12 months. But now, even the New York Fed's model, which is incredibly simplistic, it just uses the shape of the yield curve, it has uh, recession probabilities in the next 12 months about the same as the probabilities that preceded each of the three recessions of significance since 1985. So, so uh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, so given all that you've said and how we started with what you, what you told me you think the Fed will do, what do you think the Fed should do? Do you, you think the Fed should cut today? The, the data has been pretty good. It's the insurance aspect actually, of I, everything. I, 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 actually, I don't think the Fed should cut, um, actually, but they will because the bond market has given them the full green light and there's all of this kind of pressure for them to do it. I don't think the Fed should cut rates. I think, I think what the Fed needs to do is, let's step back a little bit. First of all, I think they need to develop more of a framework. It seems like every press conference that Jay Powell gives, the message is very different from the one six weeks prior. So uh, just think about how we've, the, the journey we've been on from December in terms of changing the rhetoric. And that last, uh, I guarantee one thing you're not going to hear from the Fed today. You're not going to hear mid-cycle adjustment, which was kind of the centerpiece of the press conference at the end of July. I, I think the problem with that, and it drops, you know, the Dow dropped 1,600 points uh, after that press conference, and now it's rebounded. <laughs> But I mean, I think the problem is nobody even knows what mid-cycle adjustment means. That's not a that's not a standard industry term. What does he mean, mid-cycle adjustment? Does he mean that the that he actually believes that the economy is mid-cycle after 10 years of growth and the yield curve inverted? I mean, does he really believe that? That doesn't seem credible. Or does he mean mid-cycle adjustment means that he's halfway through the tightening cycle, <laughs> that he's actually going to raise interest rates another 200 basis points after the so-called insurance policy type of activity. There's no insurance policy going on here. This has been responding to weaker data. But, Judge, as you point out, the data is nowhere near as, uh, as scary as it was uh, basically uh, uh, a, a, month ago, a month ago. So the Fed, I don't think, really needs to cut rates. It's just that they got into this place where there was this call for an a intermeeting emergency 50 basis point kind of cut that kind of uh, got the marketing gear for the fact that this is going to be a cut meeting. I don't think they should cut rates. I don't really see the purpose of it. But again, I think underneath the surface of all of this is the desire to get interest rates substantially below the inflation rate and keep them there. That's what the, the BOJ has been doing, uh, been trying to do forever. That's what Europe's been trying to do forever. And it seems that we have been uh, pivoting in the United States towards a more, uh, a more warm embrace of that type of a policy, and it's sort of succeeding. I mean, it is a way of slowing down the debt compounding problem that I've been talking about. I mean, we do know that the national debt, which, uh, the, sorry, the, the budget deficit, which understates the growth of national debt, is already higher than it was uh, here in fiscal 19 than it was in fiscal 18 by over 25 percent. But if you think so, that, we're, but, but if you think, Jeffrey, that you're going to have a, you could have a recession before the next election and you're worried yeah. about some of the things that are happening around the globe, what's wrong with the idea of an insurance cut? Part of the, the Fed's job is to prolong the economic expansion. If this is the way that they think is best to do it, why is that such a bad idea? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think that basically what you have is inflation seems to be at the Fed's target. I mean, it's what they say that the target is sort of 2 percent. It sounds like more of a floor now than a target, but that's where they are. I mean, the stock market has been, you know, uh, pretty fine. I mean, it's not really, it's been volatile. It hasn't been really going up. It's not going down. We, when, we were, when we got together in May, uh, I took a look at it this morning. I, I think the, uh, the stock market's up about 1 percent since we met way back there on May 7th. But it, at least it's not down. I mean, it's, it's, it's acting completely in a stable fashion. So why, why would you need to cut rates as insurance policy uh, when GDP is, is running at about a 4% nominal level, it looks like, real GDP from the Atlanta Fed's GDP now is at 1.8. I know that's not a 3% number that everybody hopes for, but it's, it's not uh, uh, terrible. The president says it's the greatest economy of all time, but it's really kind of an average economy right now. If you look at where we've been over the past uh, uh, post-global financial crisis, Great Recession period, we're about, on average, where we've been. So uh, I don't know, why should the Fed, uh, for most of that time period, uh, the, Fed, the Fed has been uh, in a no do-nothing mode. Then they tightened rates about nine times, and now they're cutting them a little bit. Uh, I don't exactly see what the, what the real uh, 
urgency is for cutting well, interest what, rates. What you, seems, what, seems what you say, I mean, leave the left alone. What you laid out, uh, more QE, more cuts. Uh, this could be music to the person's ears that you just mentioned, the president. Uh, that's what he wants. He wants more QE. He wants uh, rates to be cut. He would be fine with negative interest rates. What do you make of the whole, you know, dynamic that we've seen over the last several months? Well, it's a it's obvious that uh, President Trump wants the dollar to be lower. And the way to get there is to cut interest rates very dramatically so that you eliminate the interest rate differential that exists between the United States and the negative yielding areas of Japan and Europe. Uh, he, he wants that to happen. He's, he's, the, the president seems to want as much debt as possible and as much borrowing as possible. And he wants a zero interest base, a negative interest base, to facilitate an open-ended debt binge. And obviously, the Democratic Party is running on immense spending programs. So I suppose that they, though they don't talk about the, the Fed the way the president does, I suppose they would want uh, lower, uh, lower interest rates, too. So we're in this place of uh, e extreme bond supply coming at us in the next recession. And I think that's a fundamental uh, starting point to think about uh, portfolio allocations looking forward multiple years, is that when the next recession comes, it's going to be a real issue as to how we deal with the amount of bonds that are going to uh, be flooding the market. We saw this week, again, with the repo uh, um, emergency that the Fed had to enact yesterday. That was brought on because we had a mismatch in terms of maturities of bonds and cash payments for income tax and the like, and a small amount of maturing bonds and, and issuances that was about $54 billion. It was $54 billion that caused this kind of a hiccup in the short-term interest rate funding market. Just imagine what would happen if we had $3 trillion of long-term bonds floated in the, uh, in, in the wake of a recession that's coming. And I think that's really important. Right. So I think but as the deficit explodes, we should expect the dollar to be falling. We should expect the dollar to fall in the next recession. I think that is fundamental in the way we think about how we allocate assets with um, my favorite chart of the year, uh, and I used it in my webcast yesterday, which will be up on replay at doubleline.com pretty shortly, is I went back and I looked at the four major regions of the global stock market going back to the 1980s. And what happened is that the J Japanese market was the world beater in the late 80s. Uh, it was perceived to be invincible. The Japanese, the Nikkei, outperformed every market, uh, every other region, the Eurozone, the United States, and the emerging markets by a huge amount in the late 80s. And then the, the recession came in the early 90s, and it completely kneecapped the Nikkei. And interestingly, the Nikkei has never made it back to that level ever again, mm -hmm. in spite of the fact that you know, it's 30 years later. Then, uh, with the advent of the euro, there was a lot of, I think, misplaced optimism about the eurozone's possibilities, and Europe massively outperformed the rest of the world going into the OO period, uh, the dot-com bust. Right. And then the European market completely collapsed after that, and it's never made it back all this time, 20 years, it's never made it back to where it was uh, in, in the advent of the euro. And then the emerging markets were absolute world beaters from uh, into the global recession, the great financial crisis, they crushed every other market in the world. And interestingly, in that recession, the great recession, emerging markets got decimated and they've never made it back right. to Jeffrey, the peak that they were at. I, I yep. literally have less than 30 seconds left. This time goes way too fast. Uh, rapid... Let me finish my point. Let me finish my point. So Go going into this, this coming recession, whenever it comes, the United States has clearly been the world beater and has massively outperformed everybody else. I think in the next recession, we'll see the same pattern repeat where the U.S. gets kneecapped and ends up underperforming the rest of the world with the dollar weakening. And I think for that reason, as you look forward six or eight, months, six or eight years, long-term planning here, you should be allocating incrementally, gradualistically to non-dollar uh, investments and non-U.S. stock market. Uh, we'll leave it with that thought, although I wanted to ask you whether you think Jay Powell's going to finish his term. He will. His job is safe, according to Jeff, Jeffrey Gunlock. Jeff, we appreciate it as he, always. He's safe. All right. It's okay, always good to nice spend be with time you. with you. That's Jeffrey Gunlock from Double Line.